Well, this morning we're going to begin a study of 2 Corinthians, and as we go through 2 Corinthians, or perhaps in your previous studies and reading of 2 Corinthians, you've noticed that uh, it's, uh, as an epistle, a bit more difficult uh, to, to read and to understand uh, than most, if not all, the other letters or epistles that the apostle wrote. It moves quickly from one subject to another, changing uh, rather abruptly, and, and sometimes it's a little bit disorienting as you're, as you're uh, reading of one thing, and then the apostle goes to something else. And he frames 2 Corinthians as an autobiographical narrative. And that adds, I think, a particular uh, flavor and style uh, to 2 Corinthians. Corinthians, more so than any other of his epistles, will hear more about the Apostle Paul, his personal life and his ministry, especially as a missionary uh, in this epistle than we'll find in any of the other letters that he wrote. All of this points us, I think, from the very first, even our text today, uh, to the doctrine of the providence of God. In fact, if I were to identify one, one single theme that I see throughout uh, the, second, uh, the epistle of 2 Corinthians, uh, uh, in one way or another, either directly or indirectly, we see the providence of God uh, being addressed by the Apostle Paul. He also addresses some very important theological and doctrinal topics, and it's it's not typical that folks would look to 2 Corinthians uh, thinking that they're going to find some uh, profound and deep doctrines and theology there, but indeed, I think as we go through this, this study of 2 Corinthians, you'll agree uh, that there's a great deal of meat there. Now, when we talk about uh, the two epistles to the church in Corinth, first and 2 Corinthians, and we've talked about uh, this in the past, there's so much interesting history and even geography uh, that helps us understand the context in which the, the believers there in the church in Corinth lived. Uh, it's very helpful to do that, but uh, there's so much that, that could be uh, addressed, and I, there's so many things I could say to you. I don't want to overwhelm you uh, with a bunch of uh, data and information, so I'll mention just a little bit today, but what I'll do is, is I'll share bits and pieces along the way as we study uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, historical context, those kinds of things. And so our text then is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bible, hope you do, open it to the first chapter. Again, this is the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I'll read that text to you now. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comfort. This is the word of God. Yeah. Bow with me as we ask God the Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds as we study the word. Precious Holy Spirit, we do pray you would illumine our hearts and minds as we seek to study uh, this portion of Holy Scripture. We thank you for the clarity we find there. And now we ask that you would illumine us, and especially as we look ahead, look forward uh, to the application of what we discover and what we learn. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And so Paul had founded the church in Corinth during his second missionary journey uh, about 50 A.D. And just to give you a little 
a little background from the Word, if we were to turn to Acts 18, just reading a few verses there so that you can get the background. Beginning in that first verse of chapter 18 of Acts, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having re recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working uh, for by trade, they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And then skipping down, uh, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. Isn't that an interesting statement? And he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And so there's the background uh, of the founding of the church in Corinth. As we just read, Paul would stay on there for a year and a half, and he would serve as the pastor in the church of Corinth. Now, it's an interesting thing because he had co-workers, co-laborers with him, uh, so it wasn't all on his shoulders, but during that year and a half, he got to know the people of the church in Corinth quite well and grew in terms of his affection for them. He left Corinth and, and went to Ephesus, and he began to receive negative reports about what was going on in the church in Corinth. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the, the context of that city of Corinth. It was a large city, probably one of the more prosperous cities uh, in the ancient world. And it was really a hodgepodge of religions that came together and even, even certain well-known philosophies such as Stoicism uh, that came together with a, a sort of a toxic mix of a religious syncretism. And so he's dealing with this, but it was also, as we'll talk about, as I said earlier, more in the future, it was also a very immoral city. In fact, if you were to uh, want to describe someone who lived a decadent life, a life of debauchery, you might say they, they lived like Corinthians. It was so well known in the ancient world, the kinds of lives these folks uh, lived. So these folks were redeemed that came to the church, and most of them were redeemed as adults. And, and so they often uh, had one foot in the world and one foot uh, in the kingdom of God. And so they carried a lot of baggage with them. And Paul was very aware of that. Uh, but what he saw there uh, was a church that was very gifted, a church that was interested in the work of God and, and worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And so uh, he was encouraged enough that he left them. As I said, at, while he was in Ephesus, he got these negative reports, and he was so disturbed by it, uh, he changed his plans and, and make a trip, made a trip back to Corinth. But what he found there in Corinth was such opposition, such hostility antagonism by some of the factions that had developed that he had roughly left. He was very discouraged. Uh, and when he got back, he wrote a letter to the church there in Corinth that's known as a sorrowful letter. And it was a letter in which Paul poured his heart out to the people in Corinth and told them how disappointed he was and so on and so forth. We can only speculate exactly what he said. But whatever he said to them, God used this letter that he wrote uh, that's lost to us now, by the way, uh, in a very powerful way. A and the majority of the folks there in Corinth repented of their sin and their rebelliousness uh, and, and got right with God. Now, Paul would write this second epistle to the church in Corinth about 55, 56 A.D., uh, about a year after writing 1 Corinthians, the first epistle to the church in Corinth. He was in Macedonia at the time he wrote it. And just as a side note, uh, it would be one more year before he would write the epistle to the church in Rome. Now, one of the things that will be evident as we study and go through 2 Corinthians is that the church in Corinth uh, was a cause of great sadness uh, to Paul. Uh, it, was a, it was a congregation that created a great deal of stress uh, in his life, and it wouldn't have been that way if he didn't have such affection for them. He cared a great deal about the people in the church in Corinth, and so when he saw things not going the way they ought to, when he saw people 
giving themselves over to destructive patterns of behavior and those sorts of things, it created a great deal of sadness and despair uh, in him. Now, there were many factions that were developing in Corinth. In fact, Corinth is known uh, for its factionalism. Uh, there, there was a pretty substantial group uh, that were known as Judaizers. Those were the folks that continued to try to try to tell Christians they had to go back and do the things the Jews did uh, if they're going to be right with God. So he had these legalists, these, these pharisaical uh, folks who named the name of Christ but, but added a lot of stuff to their uh, understanding of the faith. So you had the Judaizers, and then you had an interesting group that were known as the divine men. And this was a smaller group, but these folks, uh, these guys thought that they could work miracles. And so they would go from church to church uh, and, and sort of like the, uh, we see with the televangelists today, you know, they would, they would suppose that they could heal people and they could do this and they could do that. Uh, but for the most part, they were simply charlatans and they would use these kinds of uh, mechanisms in order to curry favor from the people and to create these factions. Uh, and then, then there were simply rebellious folks that created factions. And so uh, it's interesting that what happened over the course of time is these factions began to unite together and form coalitions uh, and largely against uh, Paul. And anybody who's been in the ministry has experienced some of this kind of thing where you actually see uh, folks at one time that didn't really even like one another and, and the thing that seems to bring them together uh, sometimes is not love of Christ but dislike of the preacher or the, or the pastor. It's a sad thing, but it's a fact. It happens quite often. Many in the church, in the church in Corinth, especially, you know, this is a gifted church, so many of them especially um, were interested in eloquence. Uh, they, they were impressed by eloquence. And so we have a, have a man like Apollos, who was well, one of the more gifted preachers in, in Paul's time, uh, who had uh, followers, who people, people who would want to follow Apollos because of his, uh, his eloquent preaching and teaching. And evidently, he was an impressive fellow, uh, but a good man. It wasn't his fault that, uh, that certain individuals were... were uh, putting him on this pedestal and using him really as a club to beat up Paul. And they would say, well, you know, you're not as gifted a speaker as Apollos. And so that would be another thing that Paul would have to deal with, with that sort of uh, silliness. And there's always a tendency, we need to always be aware, as believers, just as Christians in church, uh, we want to be able to distinguish between delivery and substance, you see. Uh, it's possible that Paul's delivery was not great. We don't really know that, do we? We know his writing was quite good. Uh, but we, we can certainly uh, know that Paul's preaching and teaching was, was very substance. In fact, it would have been the deepest, most profound teaching that anyone could have said under. Uh, so we don't really know if he was articulate and gifted in his speech. I kind of think perhaps he wasn't that at least not compared to someone like Apollos. Now, Apollos probably had good substance too, but again, the remarkable thing about Apollos' uh, giftedness was his, his delivery of his preaching and his teaching and his sermons, uh, which evidently could be quite spellbounding. Now, let's get involved in our text. Let's look at, first of all, the first two verses, which are, if you wanted to organize uh, our text today, we would call... Uh, this the salutary greeting of Paul. He begins, uh, Paul, an apostle of Christ by the will of God. So this is important. This is not an unusual uh, salutary greeting that Paul would make at the beginning of his epistles, but it's important because throughout this epistle, Paul's going to come back to this idea of having to defend the fact that he indeed is an apostle. He does have a particular and unique authority as a, a man who held the office of apostle. But it's also important as he, as he declares this, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, by the will of God. And what he's really getting to there is that you don't just decide that you're an apostle. Uh, you have to be appointed as an apostle. In fact, there's three, there's three qualifications for apostles. And understand that it was a limited number. The apostles, uh, were, it wasn't just a, a large number of individuals. It was a small number. We may not have a complete comprehensive list, but most of us suppose that we probably uh, know who the original apostles were, plus Paul. An apostle had to be a personal witness of the resurrected Christ. Remember that Jesus actually appeared to 
Paul on the Damascus Road, didn't he? And you had to be personally commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. That was important. Again, you don't just decide, you didn't just decide that you're an apostle. Christ had to commission you as an apostle. And the third uh, qualification for an apostle is that your ministry had to be accompanied by signs and wonders, miraculous occurrences. And so Paul is citing the fact that he holds this unique authority of an apostle, not by his will, but by the will of God. And then going on there in verse 1, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now this is interesting. The Greek word there for church is ekklesia, and Simon Kistemacher in his commentary on 2 Corinthians makes a, makes a statement that helps us understand uh, both what the church was understood to be there in Corinth, but also Paul's perspective toward the church. And now what I want you to listen for here is what we call covenantal theology. You'll hear that peeking through in Kistemacher's words. From the perspective of the Corinthians, the concept, church, signified the gathering of God's people for worship, praise, and fellowship. I'm skipping down just a bit. From Paul's perspective, the expressions assembly of the Lord and assembly of God appear in the Old Testament scriptures and in the Septuagint. Those expressions become, this is in quotes, the church of the Lord and, again in quotes, the church of God. Paul, listen to this, Paul used these Old Testament appellations to show that the early Christians represented the continuation of God's true people. There's what we call covenant theology, covenantalism. According to Paul, the privileges and promises that God had given to Israel had now been applied through Christ to the church. Now, that's the minority report in evangelicalism in our day, uh, but understand that was Paul's viewpoint, uh, that was the Reformer's viewpoint, and that's certainly my viewpoint. Now, we also see toward the end of verse 1, uh, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints. The Greek word there for saints is hagioi. Now, I want to mention this because uh, we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of unsaintly behavior and attitudes there in the church in Corinth. And so most of us probably are not comfortable uh, with referring to ourselves as a saint, uh, but when we understand the way Paul's using it here, he's referring to a position before God, a consecrated position in which God uh, takes a person, redeems him, and then sets him apart as his person as his child. And so we understand uh, that this appellation, this, this term saints, doesn't refer to behavior or practice so much here as it does position before God. And that's important for us to understand. Now, in verse 2, the continued greeting, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, uh, we can certainly just read past this without thinking much about it, but here we have the grace of redemption uh, which brings us with peace with God, to peace with God. Understand that the unregenerate person uh, is, according to Scripture, an enemy of God. I'm not saying that people identify themselves as an enemy of God, uh, but their spiritual status is such that they are hostile toward God, the things of God. And so what happens when God the Holy Spirit applies redemption to us uh, and we're truly regenerated, effectually called regenerated and given faith and repentance into life, justified, um, adopted, and sanctified, when that happens, then we are at peace with God. But this is only occurring by the grace of God and in Jesus Christ. We're only redeemed uh, by and through Jesus Christ. By His, by his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, by His shed blood, by His righteousness imputed to us, we are then at peace with God because of what Christ has done. And again, we could just read through that and not think about it, but again, He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's so very, very important. Now let's go into verses 3 through 7. As we read through uh, these, this part of our text, uh, you will have noted that, that we heard the word comfort several times, didn't we? In fact, this is an unusual 
piece of scripture, portion of scripture here, we actually have that one word, comfort, uh, that appears uh, in those uh, five verses ten times. Again, very, very uh, unusual, uh, but I think that we can presume and assume uh, that the reason it appears there is because Paul's trying to tell us something. He's trying to inform us in regard to something. Now, the Greek word uh, for comfort is uh, parakleo, uh, and in some translations, that word comfort, uh, and perhaps one in, uh, translation you might be using this morning, it might be rendered as encourage, or it might be rendered as console, uh, but the basic idea is very obvious and direct. Now, to understand why Paul is urging us to be comforted uh, and to give comfort to others, we must have some understanding of what I said was, I think, the overriding theme of 2 Corinthians, and that is the providence of God. Now, if we were to look to the Westminster Confession, fifth chapter is actually entitled Of Providence. And I'm not going to read all of this to you, but uh, if you'll uh, be patient with me and tolerant, I'll, I'll read just a bit. And, uh, and again, you know, this was written by the Westminster Divines in, in the 1640s. Uh, and so the language is, is a little deeper than, than we're used to using and certainly uh, reading. So I'll try to Try to focus on that portion that I think is the most important and salient to us. God, the great creator of all things, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, according to his infallible knowledge, foreknowledge, and the free and immutable unchanging counsel of his own will to the praise of the glory of His wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Now, uh, that is paragraph one of the Westminster Confession uh, defining for us providence. Question and answer 18 from the larger catechism speaks to the same thing, but condenses it a bit. Let me read that very quickly. What are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are His whole, most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures, ordering them and all their actions to his own glory. So therein we have a good, solid understanding and definition of the providence of God. Now, the providence of God may be seen in all the good things that we enjoy in life, but this is uh, the, the part that I think the Apostle Paul is really getting at here in our text today, Providence also includes what we might call dark providences, difficulties, struggles, trials, tribulation, troubles, and as he actually refers to them, afflictions. And so if we embrace the doctrine of the providence of God, uh, we're embracing the fact uh, that everything that occurs is within the providence of God. He governs His creation. He's the Creator. He governs and sustains and maintains His creation. And so that includes what we might call good things as well as the things that, well, are not so good. This is where theology, I think, uh, meets with genuine human needs. When we begin to talk about uh, providence, the providence of God, especially, let me say especially, those dark providences, this is when we get into uh, the kinds of things that you and I struggle with daily. Perhaps not always in this, to the same degree, but throughout our lives, if you live very long, you're going to experience what we might call dark providences. And we must recognize, if we're going to find any peace in this life, at some point, uh, that even the dark providences, everything that happens in our lives, uh, comes from God. But He doesn't just leave us out there to struggle with these dark uh, providences, these afflictions. Paul's telling us that He actually provides for us, you could say supernaturally, a high degree and quantity of comfort that comes from God Himself. So very, very important. Now, this idea of, of dark providences is, is historically really a challenge for people to understand. Let me just very quickly illustrate what I'm, I'm talking about here. There's a problem when we think about dark providence. 
when we think about the afflictions that come our way, if you believe that God's in control of everything, that He's governing the universe, and here's these evil things that are occurring around us, and maybe even to us, involving us, uh, this is a tough thing to swallow. There's a name that theologians have given this. It's called the Odyssey. Sounds like a board game, doesn't it? It'd be a good board game. We ought to create a board game of theodicy. But the idea of theodicy can be represented in a very simple way with a triangle like this. So the problem that theodicy addresses uh, is what we would just simply call the problem of evil. And each of these points on the triangle uh, represents something that we know about God, right? So God is good. God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and God is omniscient, all-knowing, okay? Now, <clears throat> In uh, this, this triangle, then, we have three uh, attributes of God uh, that pose a problem when we recognize the problem of evil. And so those that would struggle with this concept would say, well, okay, I believe God's all-powerful, I believe God's all-knowing, but then He can't be good, or we, else we wouldn't have this problem of evil. Or they would say this, they say, well, I know that God is good, I know that He knows all things, but He lacks the power to change things. Or they would say this, I know God's good, I know He's all-powerful, but He must not know the afflictions that I'm going through right now. It doesn't make sense to me. These things seem to be a contradiction. So this is the, this is the issue addressed by theodicy. And this is kind of a, a complex doctrine, uh, but I, uh, one of my prized possessions is this first edition book. Now, this was written by Albert Taylor Bledsoe in 1854. He was a, a Methodist preacher, and he was a professor of mathematics and astronomy at the University of Mississippi. So just to you have your American history chronology, that's, that's seven, six and a half, seven years before the War Between the States broke out. Now, this first edition book is special to me uh, because it belonged to Robert Louis Dabney. Now, how do I know that? Because he signed the inner flap and dated it, and he even said, I paid $1.50 for this book. <laughs> now, Robert Louis Dabney at this time uh, was a professor of systematic theology at Union Seminary. And, and he was uh, one of the, 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 the great lights of what we call Southern Presbyterianism. Now, some of you history buffs will also know uh, that Robert Louis Dabney became uh, the chief of staff uh, for a very famous Confederate general. You might know who that would be? Stonewall Jackson, right? Uh, the old uh, Presbyterian deacon warrior. And so, and so Dabney was an interesting guy. He actually, after the war, again, I, I do tend to get in the weeds on history a little bit, don't I? But after the, after the war between the states, he would actually move eventually uh, to Austin, Texas. Uh, and uh, he was very involved in founding the University of Texas there. And he actually uh, um, started the, the particular department, the University of T Texas, that we would call the philosophy department uh, today. He ended up, uh, some years later, uh, dying in Victoria, Texas. Uh, that's uh, Victoria, Texas is the place you go to die. <laughs> his his um, daughter and son-in-law and her family actually lived in Victoria, Texas. So, uh, so he died there in the uh, 18, I think, uh, I think 1890s. I can't remember exactly, but they actually took his body and he was buried at Union Seminary in Virginia. Okay. Enough of, uh, of, a, of a rabbit trail there. Uh, but the, the point I wanted to make on this is that this, this book is quite profound. It's not an easy read. But after you read it, you really don't feel like this problem is resolved. All you feel like, at least the way I felt, is that, is that basically uh, Bledsoe did a good job of framing the problem of theodicy, but he didn't resolve it for us. And the reason he didn't resolve it for us is because nobody can. Uh, this, 
this causes us to reflect on uh, that scripture verse that we've read more than once uh, from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. Listen to this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so we understand that this problem known as theodicy is really not something we're ever going to be able to work out on our own with our, our limited intellects. We're not, uh, we're not omniscient. We don't understand everything. Uh, we're finite creatures. But nevertheless, it's an important thing to recognize. Let's be honest about the fact that when we find ourselves facing particular afflictions in our lives, uh, we do find ourselves asking the questions, why? Why God? Especially uh, if we know that God's our Father in heaven, it's a difficult thing for us to come to terms with. Now, in our text today, the apostle is not explaining to us uh, in a comprehensive and exhaustive way why dark providences occur. In verses 4 through 7, he's simply uh, presenting them to us as a given. This is the way life is. We have these afflictions, so what do we do with them? And he's telling us uh, how we might get through them. So let me, let me make three final points here. We're moving toward uh, administering the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So even now we want our hearts to be submitted to and, and being prepared by God the Holy Spirit. First point, the comfort that's promised to believers is first of all from God. Let me go back to verses 3 and 4 in our text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this. The Father of mercies and God of our comfort. God of all comfort. And so we understand that God Himself is the source of the Christian's comfort, the ultimate source. That's where it comes from. Our reserve uh, to give us the wherewithal to deal with the afflictions of life comes from God Himself. We first look to God Himself. And He's promising here to comfort us because the comfort we get from God flows out of an inexhaustible storehouse of mercy. Now, this is important. Again, we read it there. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. You see, the comfort that God promises to us comes out of God's mercy. Now, why is this important? Well, understand that he's talking here about all afflictions that we encounter. So we might think, as Christians, we might think, okay, so he's talking then uh, about the afflictions that come upon us that we haven't caused. He's promising to comfort us uh, when we feel afflicted uh, because something has happened that we couldn't do anything about. We didn't bring it on ourselves. We can't, we can't solve the problem. No, no, that's not the nature of mercy. Mercy is compassion that's shown on a beneficiary regardless of the response or what that person, has, that beneficiary has done. And so the mercy of God then is the basis for this comfort. And understand this, even if you have messed up royally, you've really made some errors, some mistakes, some poor choices. Understand, the Apostle Paul, inspired by God the Holy Spirit, is assuring us that God is merciful and He will comfort you. Second point, God's comfort doesn't flow to you and then dry up. You see, that's very important. As we think about this passage, we understand that the comfort that comes from God is giving to us, bestowed upon us, so that we will be able to comfort others. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our afflictions, again, not just some, not just those that came on us as innocent parties, all our afflictions, so that we will be able to do what? To comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You see how important that is? We understand then in the midst of going through afflictions uh, that we are supposed, we're actually being equipped and prepared to comfort other folks who are going through or will go through a similar affliction in their lives. Now, we're not all going to face the same dark providences. As I look out, and those of you that I know well, uh, I know some of the dark providences you've dealt with, are dealing with, might be dealing with in the future. Uh, but I also understand that not everybody faces the same kind of afflictions. Now, I'll also say that some people seem to have more than their share of afflictions. You know folks like that? Uh, you know, like that in Peanuts, that little black cloud? 
kid, you know. There, there are folks like that. They just seem, you know, I, sometimes I just think, gosh, man, I feel so badly for them. I wish that, I wish that the, their life would change. It just seems like there's one thing after another that goes wrong. And so some people do have a greater share of the afflictions that result from living in a fallen world amongst fallen people. But that said, everybody does have some stuff. If you haven't had some stuff, right down the line, you expect it. I remember years ago, I was preaching on a similar topic, not, not this. I, I don't repeat sermons, and, and I don't mean that as a, 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 to brag. I, it's probably because none of my sermons have been that good that I wanted to, to repeat them. Uh, but I never do. And anyway, I, was, I do talk about the same kinds of stuff. And, and those of you that know me know that I, that I repeat my illustrations and anecdotes endlessly, you know, because I only have about six or seven. I only know about one or two jokes and a, just a few anecdotes, so you have to hear them over and over. But anyway, this fellow was, this couple, they were, they were military. His wife was, uh, uh, I, I think, in the civil side of the military, and I, I don't know all the, uh, all the particulars, but, but her rating was uh, she was a general, and, you know, comparable to a general, and he was, uh, uh, I think, a full bird colonel. And anyway, they were just sort of a, you know, a, a blessed couple. Uh, they didn't have any children. Uh, they were, you know, they had obviously good income and good life and whatnot. They were uh, they were in good health. Everything was great. I remember I was talking about this dark providence, these afflictions, and the fellow came up to me after one of the services when I was preaching or teaching on this stuff, and he said, "I don't, I just don't understand what you're talking about." I said, "You know, I, I never had any problems in my life. I said, we got a great life. Everything's cool. You know, we just never experienced the stuff you're talking about. And you're saying that everybody has these kind of problems. Uh, we haven't ever had any problems. You know, and I, I didn't know what to say. Actually, what I was thinking, well, just wait." Just wait. And then two years later, his wife fell. Uh, she had just retired. They were living in God's country up in Colorado somewhere. And, and she fell and hit her head in the bathroom and died just like that. And, and he came back and asked me if I'd do you know, the service for them. And of course I did, but, but I didn't say, well, you know, there you are. That's not going to happen to everybody, but the point is that everybody does have struggles eventually. Not the same kind, but there will be afflictions. Now, uh, let me go to that word comfort real, real quickly. Our English word comfort comes from two Latin words. Con, C-O-N, and forte, F-O-R-T-E. And if you put those together, you know what it means? To make strong together. And so what the apostle's saying here is that we, can, we comfort one another and by virtue of the fact that we're in this together supporting, encouraging, and consoling one another, we can get through these afflictions. Third and finally, when we struggle with affliction, as I said earlier, we almost always ask, Lord, why is this happening? I know, I know some of you guys are going through some difficult times. I know that question comes to you. Ask, you know, Lord, why is this happening to us? Why are you allowing this to happen to my kiddos or my grandkids? Or, or, or why are you letting that person uh, do these kinds of things to, uh, to my family? That's, that's human. We ask those kinds of questions. We may never, though, listen to this, and Paul really implies this in what he's saying. We may never understand why a particular affliction comes our way. You've got to get that. Understand that if you think that you're going to be able to figure out uh, why you have the problems you have, sometimes you can. Sometimes you see a cause and effect relationship. You think, well, the reason that's happening is because I did thus and so. Or the reason, reason my kid's having this problem is because he won't do thus and so. You know, sometimes we can collect, connect the dots that way. But more often than not, we simply have to recognize that afflictions come as a consequence of the fall. And the fact that we live in a fallen world uh, amongst fallen men and women, we ourselves are fallen creatures, uh, and there are just going to be, the law of second cause says there's going to be some, uh, some uh, negative effects when you live in a fallen world. Even if we do everything right, none of us do, but let's suppose that we did do everything right, we still live in this fallen world, we're still going to suffer afflictions. Understand, let me say this to you, be encouraged by this, the fact that you're struggling with a particular thing doesn't mean you've done anything wrong necessarily. This is a, a consequence of the fall. Now, we also understand as a reason that God 
afflicts us, if we really get to the meat of divine providence, the reason God afflicts us is to sanctify us, okay? Now, I wish that I could become more Christ-like by just setting my mind on that and deciding, hey, I'm going to be more Christ-like. But I'm telling you, that's not the way it's worked in my life. I'm 70 years old, and I can tell you uh, that those times that have been the most fruitful uh, in bringing about a Christian character in my life have been the most difficult times of my life. And my wife and I and our kids, you know, those of you that know us, we've had some afflictions in our life. Some of them came at us. We didn't cause them. Some of them, I think, we caused. But, but the sanctifying work of God the Holy Spirit uh, was most fruitful during those times of affliction. So I'm telling you, one of the reasons you're going to face, uh, uh, face affliction is because uh, uh, God has promised that He's going to complete a work in you. Hasn't He promised that in Philippians 1.6? He's going to complete the work He began in you until the day of Christ Jesus. And the way He's going to do that often is through afflicting dark providences. Now, What I'm saying to you, my friends, is that, is that it's often in the most painful periods of time in our lives uh, that we grow nearest to God. I can say this with a certainty. It's during those most difficult times in our lives that we grow in dependence on God. Isn't that true? Because we tend to think of ourselves independently, that we can get along on our own. We plan our lives. Those of you, many people here, you're, you're sharp folks. You're disciplined folks. A lot of you have planned your life and things have worked out pretty well in those things that you can control. That's the way we operate quite often. But, but understand, it's when things don't go as planned, that's usually when we find ourselves on our knees before God and growing in dependence upon Him. And listen, humility is always a good thing. It's always a good thing. You cannot, you're not going to find in Scripture a place where it says, don't be too humble. That's not the way it works. What the Scripture says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. And our tendency, especially as Americans, you know, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we're, you know, all, especially in our congregation, you guys, you know, you're all John Wayne, right? You know, <laughs> isn't that right, Pilgrim? <laughs> well, that's toxic. To developing the character of Christ. I, I like John Wayne, okay? You know, Pilgrim, I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, but, but I also understand uh, that, that I'm really, a lot of things I planned in my life didn't turn out exactly the way I expected. And as I look back, though, I see that the affliction was painful and difficult, wouldn't choose it again, I recognize I'm in a better place because of that affliction. And so understand uh, that these afflictions that come your way do have a purpose, though, as we read from the prophet Isaiah, we may not know exactly what that purpose is. But I can tell you one thing that we do know from our text today. The affliction that's come your way has come your way so that you can do what to other people? Comfort them. So that you can do what to other people? Comfort them. The circumstance that you've dealt with may be very unique, but believe me, someone else has gone through or will go through the same kind of thing. Close on this. Just last week, I got a call from a fellow teaching elder who's going through a, a, a difficult affliction. And the reason he called me was not because, you know, I'll call Dick because he's a font of wisdom. No, that's not at all why he called. The reason he called me is that he knew that I had gone through a similar circumstance uh, in the past, and he wanted to be able to talk to somebody that he didn't have to explain how he's feeling to, that just know, just like that, I knew what he's going, I know what he's going through. I know how difficult it is. And I didn't really have much to say to him. Uh, and he wasn't really asking for my counsel or advice. He called me because he was in, in need of consoling, consolation, comfort, and encouragement. And this instance, the encouragement wasn't so much what I said, it's the fact that I was listening to him and I understood. And so you can bet that whatever you're going through, have gone through, will go through, at least we know that God's purpose in it is to equip you and prepare you 
to comfort and console and encourage others who go through a similar circumstance. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank You for Your blessings and grace. Thank You uh, that we have Your Word and with the illumination of Your Holy Spirit, uh, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It can cut to uh, the very depth of our hearts, revealing our motivations and why we do what we do, why we think what we think. We need that, Lord, and we thank You for that. I pray for each one here, if perhaps they're in the midst of an affliction, that uh, they will be comforted uh, from You, directly from You, through Your Holy Spirit, that You will comfort them in the midst of their dark providence. And also that we would learn to comfort one another. Be sensitive to what one another is going through. In the blessed name of Jesus we pray. Amen.